everyone. I'm Kenny Baraka, and I will be your host for today's, this month's World Book Day Book Club. We are awfully delighted and a little bit excited to have with us not one, but two authors today. Uh, we have M.G. Lennon and Sam Sedrin, the authors of the Adventures on Training series, with their newest installment, Danger on Dead Man's Pass, which is our World Book Day Book Club pick of the month. How's everybody doing today? Great, Kenny, it's lovely to see you. So great and so excited to be here talking to you. Pop, bang, boom, snap, here we go. <laughs> now, generally, I would ask the author, in this case, authors, to tell us a little bit about themselves, because very often we, we know a lot more about their work than we do the great minds and pens behind it. But in this particular case, I reckon it might be interesting to switch it up a bit. Maya, if you might, tell us a little something about Sam and Sam, if you might tell us a little something about Maya. Hmm. Now be nice. <laughs> what can I tell you about Sam? Please be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's not gonna surprise anyone to know that Sam is a massive fan of trains and has been ever since he was a little boy. It's one of the reasons we're writing together. But what you may not know about Sam is that Sam's career started off as a playwright and we actually met at the National Theatre. Uh, he came to work for me and I used to be his boss. And that's how our writing partnership started. <laughs> it was. Uh, and before uh, Maya was my boss, um, a lot of people know that Maya is obsessed with Beatles uh, because, of course, her first book was all about Beatles. It was called Beetle Boy. But a lot of people don't know that before Maya worked at the National Theatre being my boss, she had the most incredible and awesome and varied career. She was an actress. She worked in the music industry. She managed the Divine Comedy. <laughs> Haven't you been on Broadway with Holly Hunter? Yes, I have. Yes, she has. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have a, a, a rather experienced and journey person lineup and roster behind Dead Danger at Dead Man's Pass. And yeah, Kenny, is that your way of saying that I'm really old? No, it's my way of saying you're really old. <laughs> I didn't say it, Sam did. <laughs> I'm old, it's fine. And, and speaking of what we can and cannot say, without divulging too much to us, because obviously we'd love to, to, to lose ourselves in the, the mystery and the brilliance of the craft, can you tell us a little bit about Danger at Dead Man's Pass? Absolutely. So Danger at Dead Man's Pass is the fourth installment of the Adventures on Trains series. Every book in this series is a standalone adventure. Each one takes place in a different country. The Highland Falcon Thief, the first one, took place in the UK on the last journey of the Royal Steam Train. The second one, Kidnap on the California Comet, took place on a journey all the way across America. The third one, Murder on the Safari Star, took place on a luxury rail safari in South Africa. But this one, Danger at Dead Man's Pass, is a spooky Halloween-y adventure story. It's a transcontinental journey deep into the Hartz Mountains in Germany, where our main character, Harrison Beck, and his uncle, Nathaniel Bradshaw, have to go undercover to investigate a mysterious death possibly caused by an ancient family curse. This one's a real spook fest. I'm seeing a through line here. It seems that this this book, and, and as we pointed out, illustrated, demonstrated, the other books in the series bring together these two things, trains and mystery. Mm. For you, what brought those two things together? Well, right at the beginning of this whole process, um, I should say, as many as all the other jobs I've done, I'm also a mum uh, and I've got sons. I've got two sons and my boys always loved trains right from a very early age they played with brio and then they had lego trains and then hornby trains and we used to go to steam railways uh, on holidays with the grandparents they've always loved trains and they loved thomas the tank engine and and then they got to the age where they started being ready to read chapter books and they wanted to read books that were set on real trains and i went around libraries and i went around bookshops and I really couldn't find any adventures set on trains. So I had the idea, but I didn't really have the ability to execute it because I, before I wrote this book of series, this, these books with Sam, I didn't know anything about trains at all. 
Uh, and that's why we hooked up together. But the mystery element is something that Sam definitely brought to the project. So I'd never thought of writing a children's story before until Maya suggested that we write these series of books together. Like she said, I used to be a playwright and I thought I would only write for grown-ups. But when she told me about like her, how she'd look for these books for her sons, it was so exciting to me because I was just like her sons when I was growing up. I loved trains. I had a railway line at the bottom of my guards and I would always wave at them as they went past. Um, and uh, when she suggested this, I immediately immediately thought it would be incredible to make these mystery stories because I've always been obsessed with mysteries. I loved reading Agatha Christie when I was growing up and Sherlock Holmes and I'm obsessed with crime fiction. When I moved to London I actually had a company for a short while creating murder mystery treasure hunts for people where they would uh, run all over the streets looking for clues to solve made up murders. And I thought a train is a fantastic place to set a mystery because they're, they're self-contained, you've got a fixed number of characters, there's a ticking clock because you've got to solve it before the train gets to its destination destination. And as soon as these two things came together, it was like lightning in a bottle. We came up with so many ideas together for all the amazing train journeys that we could set our adventure stories on and all the amazing crimes that we could set on the trains uh, once we wrote them. And that's how the ideas came together. Now those two ideas, they're a partnership of, of, of sorts. Yeah. And so are you two, a partnership of, of, of sorts. And it's not totally unheard of, but it's rather rare to have two authors, two full-fledged authors working on a piece. Could you tell us a little bit about the advantages and maybe some of the <laughs> disadvantages? Well, he wants to dig the dirt. You want to if we may cry <laughs> into working together to, to, to write a book. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, to be honest, there aren't that many disadvantages. No. <laughs> uh, and I, and I, as someone who has written many books on my own and many books now with Sam, uh, they're very different experience, but one of the real joys of writing a book with someone is that when you have an idea on your own, you don't really know how good it is, which bits are a bit hokey, which bits need fixing. Um, and quite often you can think yourself in circles. But when you write with someone and you have an idea, um, for a start, there's no shortage of ideas. Like quite often what our conversations are like escalating idea pitches where someone will go, what about this? Oh no, what about that? Or then you could do that and it gets very exciting. Um, but if you come up with lots of ideas uh, and you're working with someone else, they'll very quickly go, oh no, that won't work, that won't work. And it's a very good sifting mechanism to get a hardcore bunch of really solid ideas to go into your book because books are really thirsty for drama and ideas and you need as many as possible, I think particularly in a series. Uh, so that's one of the real benefits of writing together, I think. I think so. A lot of people often ask us, do you fight? Do you have arguments? And like, we do a little bit, but not really. Because we used to work together, we're really used to telling each other, like, that's not a good idea, or we should do this differently. And and I think we're both quite open-minded people. We always have a rule that we both have to like something for it to go into the books, which is a really good way of settling any kind of disagreements we might have. Although, because we've been writing for so long now, I think we're both often on the same page quite a lot of time. Um, I will say that we don't do what some co-authors do, which is just sit in a room together at the same keyboard and like write together. And do you think a comma should go there? No, I don't <laughs> think so. That would drive me crazy. Uh, that's not what we do. We write separate drafts, sort of we alternate back and forth and we plot the whole thing together. So there's a lot yeah. of talking, a lot of hanging out, a lot of fun involved. I mean, I tend to like writing really early in the morning and you tend to like writing kind of later in the day oh yeah i don't get up until like, yeah the afternoon. so <laughs> if, if we tried to be in a room together one of us would be asleep <laughs> absolutely it's true there are many elements to to a book to a piece of to a narrative to a story um you know there's tone and tense and, and characters but setting setting is obviously an, an important part of a narrative of storytelling can you tell us a little bit about the setting for this particular book and how you chose it and, and, and a little bit about it? Yes. Yeah, so all, so setting is really at the, at the starting point of all of our stories. So when we're thinking about, I mean, right back at the very beginning when we were thinking about what the series was, we started with all of these amazing railway journeys all over the world that I thought would be incredible places to set stories. And so you look at that railway and you think, what makes this place interesting? So Danger at Dead Man's Pass is set on a railway journey from the UK 
way all the way to Germany. So we've got an amazing illustration of it up here that you might be able to see that Maya's holding up. One of the most fun things about our books is they all have maps in. I love a book with a map, so I'm excited that ours have them in. Um, so this story, it's uh, they get on the Eurostar in London, they go through the Channel Tunnel to Paris, our characters spend some time in Paris, then they take the night train to Berlin, they spend some time in Berlin, but then most of the story is set in a town called Wernigrode at the foot of the snowy Harz Mountains in Germany, um, which are really famous for uh, kind of being part of German folklore. It's where uh, the, uh, the play by Goethe, Faust, was set. Um, so it's full of sort of spooky elements. There's a festival of witchcraft there called Walpurgisnacht. Um, there was a lot of a supernatural folklore elements that we decided to weave into the story. And that's really how we how we come up with a lot of the content of the stories is we we start with our setting and we look at what makes that place interesting. What are the stories of that place or that railway? What do they have to tell us? And then ideas just suggest themselves to us and then they find a way of weaving themselves into our mystery. In this book in particular, we actually did the entire journey that the characters do. So just before uh, COVID brought lockdown into our lives, luckily for us in the January before that happened, we actually did the entire trip. We did the Eurostar, we did the sleeper train to Berlin, we went to Wernigrode, we rode the Brockenbahn. Uh, and by having that uh, that research trip, we were able to just note down everything that delighted and fascinated us as we did the journey. One of the things that is a real joy, I think, about our series is that you could just get a ticket and go and do this journey yourself. Mm -hmm. This is all real. They're real places, they're real trains. Um, you know, obviously we have a fictional story set on them, but if you wanted to do the journey yourself, you absolutely could. In addition to the, I guess, really rich setting, there's also these incredibly vivid and almost living illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, how does the illustration process work? Wh how do you choose which illustrations which which things to be illustrated and what when in the process of writing and publishing i guess when does do the illustrations get slotted in maybe so we have to say right right from yeah. the first that neither of us can draw nope. <laughs> <laughs> we do not do the illustrations they are done by an incredible artist called elisa paganelli she does the covers she does the route maps and she does all of the illustrations and one of the things we haven't yet said is that our detective who solves all these mysteries is an artist and so all of the sketches that you see in the book are actually drawings that he has done and they're in his sketchbook so they are a part of the plot and quite Quite often he captures clues in his drawings so an eagle-eyed reader who is examining his drawings may also be able to solve the crime as he does and see the things that he sees so yeah elisa is incredible she works incredibly quickly and we are so lucky to have her on board because mm. um one of the things that we always have to do is to be very particular about the details that need to be included in these illustrations um we sort of come up with the briefs for them as we're writing the story but if we change a part of the plot you know a very important part of the illustration has to change sometimes we have to ask her to put characters standing in a different order or to make sure someone is holding a piece of paper or something like that so really fine details. She's always able to get them right and we absolutely love her. Yeah, and she always likes to have read the manuscript before she does the picture because sometimes we'll write a, a, a loose brief of what the illustration should be and then she'll send us a drawing back and she's read the thing. She's got an idea of what we want, but she knows how to make it better. And that's the thing that's a real joy about working with Elisa. She does the entire series um, and each book has got a different artistic style so Hal when he starts off in the Highland Falcon Thief he's uh, he likes drawing but he hasn't developed his skill so it's he's just got a biro and a sketchbook but as he goes on he becomes more interested in art so by the time he goes to South Africa and Murder on Safari Star he's got uh, charcoal and he's doing charcoal sketches uh, and this one because of the the tone of the book uh, is much darker it's pen and ink and a lot of cross hatching and so we're able to explore different artistic styles and Elisa's incredible she just picks up the idea and really runs with it. We talked a bit earlier about the different elements involved in, in the storytelling and the narrative uh, along with setting characters characters are quite important and the relationship between characters could you discuss with us a little bit about the relationship between Hal who you mentioned earlier and Uncle Nat 
Absolutely. So that's really at the heart of the story for us. It's kind of the, it's the engine that drives it. We knew we wanted to have uh, a, a young boy detective at the heart of our story when we first started writing. And we knew he was going to have an amazing uncle uh, who was a travel writer who would take him on all these amazing journeys. So the two of them have quite a strange relationship at the start. Nat, uh, um, uh, Hal thinks that Nat is a bit weird. Hal doesn't understand why he likes trains so much. But over the course of the series, they become really close and more like friends. And by the time we get to Danger at Dead Man's Pass, the two of them are really close. But one of the things that's interesting about Danger at Dead Man's Pass is that Hal discovers that Uncle Nat might have been hiding some things from him. There's more to Uncle Nat than we thought. And one of the most lovely things for me about Danger in Dead Man's Pass is we really get to deepen that relationship a little bit more. Um, so the two of them are really kind of at the heart of our story. Um, but it's really important also we should say that Hal makes friends with different people that he meets along the way. We always wanted to give um, Hal, you know, a sidekick, like the, the Dr. Watson to his Sherlock Holmes in all of our stories. So he befriends a different child in every story that's from the countries that he's visiting. Because, I mean, one of the great things about traveling is that you always meet people as you travel. So um, in Danger at Dead Man's Pass, Hal makes friends with some of the children from the Kratzenstein family, who are the family that uh, sort of he's infiltrating undercover to investigate this mysterious death. One of the things that we always kind of joke about, but which is really quite true, is that, um, you know, quite often authors put themselves into characters and uh, Sam is Uncle Nat because it's I, true, it's I, true. I am mentally about 12. And when this adventure started, I wasn't interested in trains and I really... I thought when we wrote together that he could just do all the boring train stuff yeah. uh, and I wouldn't have to do that. That's why I'm writing with him because I, I don't like trains. Uh, and the first thing he made me do is go to the railway museum in York. Uh, and I was like, oh man, that sounds like the most boring day out ever to go and look at some old trains in a museum. Uh, uh, but he dragged me there reluctantly uh, and I was completely blown away. It really opened my eyes to the, just the genius of, uh, engineering that a train is and the way it's connected communities uh, and really like I I am Hal the reluctant 12 year old that doesn't want to learn about trains uh, and I'm being whisked along this incredible learning curve learning about trains learning about travel I'm not even a very good traveler uh, and so so that's the thing is is that our real life relationship does feed a little bit in to Uncle Nat and Hal um, me being 12 and you knowing lots. <laughs> and one thing I should say is that we've talked about Elisa's incredible illustrations. For a long time, we'd never met Elisa. And she'd never met us. She'd because never of seen, the pandemic. Because of the pandemic. And she'd never seen pictures of us. But the illustrations of Uncle Nat in the books are me like they just it's me they look exactly like me we have the same glasses we have the same jumpers we have the same hair and i'm like how did this happen it's just so i'm not gonna fight it i love uncle matt i think he's a great character i would love to be more like uncle matt uh be more uncle matt that's my motto i suppose <laughs> be batman or uncle Nat. yeah um <laughs> one thing we've kind of discovered uh doing the world book day book club is that many authors, if not all authors, began as readers. Mm. And with that, I'm hoping you each might be able to tell us one of your favorite books. A book that's very dear and important to me from a very young age was The Railway Children. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I grew up near a railway line, so I absolutely connected to these children in Ina's bit story who, you know, uh, spend a lot of time playing around on the railway line near their house. Um, it's it's an adventure story. It's also kind of a mystery story. It really captures that wonderful love and wonder of kind of the golden age of steam. I've always loved the books of E. Nesbitt as well, um, who writes such brilliant adventures for uh, young readers. And that's definitely a sense of that wonder and joy and the idea of the world being a place that's open for exploration and adventure is something that we've really tried to capture in Adventures on Trains because, you know, for me, writing these books is very much about reconnecting with who I was as a younger reader, you know, when I was obsessed with trains uh, growing up and reading The Railway Children. And I think, well, I had lots of favourite books. I, I read everything voraciously. Um, and 
My favorite books really are the ones that have stuck with me all my life, all the way through to adulthood. So I will love a book when I was a child and read it, but quite often it'll get replaced by whatever comes next. Um, but there are a few that have really stayed with me. Uh, and the book that has stayed with me the most, that like if you cut me open like a stick of rock, you'd probably see it written uh, in a ring on the inside of me, is The Secret Garden uh, by Francis Hodgson Burnett. And the reason why I love The Secret Garden, uh, it's very problematic now for lots of reasons, but essentially the protagonist, Mary Lennox, is horrible. Like when you start, when you meet her as a reader, you're like, oh, she's ugh, horrible. But then she's put in an even more horrible and isolating situation. Her parents have died. She goes to a spooky old house. She's on her own. Uh, she's treated meanly, but she behaves abysmally, um, which I kind of enjoyed. Uh, but then she discovers the secret garden that's completely overgrown uh, and gone wild. Uh, and she uh, meets a boy called Dickon who knows all about gardening and knows how to commune with nature and uh, you know what, what the birds' names are and how to feed them and what they like. Uh, and she becomes, slowly and surely, uh, she falls in love with the natural world. And I also fell in love with the natural world whilst reading that book. I didn't grow up with a place with big gardens and doing that kind of outdoorsy stuff. I was very disconnected from it. Uh, and I've always thought if Mary Lennox can do it, then so can I. And it's a book that I reread as an adult and really understood the thematic exploration of things like the power of nature to be good for your mental health, your physical health, uh, how it can really open you up as a human and see the beauty of the world um, and give great joy. And it's got a, like a healing power. So that book really has taken me on a journey. And also my first ever crush was Dickon. I did fall in love with him. So that's another reason too. <laughs> Here on World Book Day Book Club, we like to combine our reading with a little bit of eating. And I think even more so because this is set on a train where, you know, a little bit of noshing is, is, is good for you, is, is expected. If you could suggest a snack for us to partake in while we're reading Danger on Dead Men's Pass, what might that snack be? So we always get told off for putting far too much food into our books uh, <laughs> because one of the great things about traveling by train, a uh, traveling period, is the food. Like, you know, we have, we have dining cars, you know, we have amazing yeah. meals and stuff. Yeah. People keep saying like, why is there so much food here? And we're like, because it's great. Um, but these are set on trains and one of our favorite things to do on trains is eat. Um, <laughs> there are some great meals in this I think story. I foot plate from Highland. But yeah. yeah, so I mean, well, that's that's cheating because that's the Highland Falcon theme, isn't I it? I know, but it is my favorite. It's my okay, favorite. Okay, well you tell this story and then okay. I'll put my own. So in the Highland Falcon Thief, in the first book, um, we discovered when we went to the National Railway Museum that I thought would be boring, but it turned out not to be. Uh, when we went there, we met a lovely woman who allowed us to go on the footplate of the Mallard. Uh, and she said that one of the things that was amazing about the steam trains uh, is obviously the boiler got so hot that the fireman and the driver would bring food and they would stuff it down between the pipes of the boiler and it would cook as they drove along. Uh, and uh, one of the most popular things to be cooked by steam engine was a baked potato. So they would bring a potato wrapped in silver foil, stuff it down uh, beside the engine and it would get cooked by uh, the steam engine. Uh, and then so in our book, we had, we stole that, we put it in. We've got a baked potato with baked beans. The, the, the can is on top of the locomotive. So it heats up the beans uh, and a fried egg cooked on the shovel that goes into the firebox. So I think the best thing to eat on a train, if you can get it cooked by the steam engine, is steam engine, baked potato, baked beans, and a fried egg on top. And if you don't have access to a steam engine boiler, we should say that Maya's favorite biscuit is a custard cream, yes. and that as a, a character in Murder on the Safari Star says, who's a, who's a writer, some of her very best novels have been powered by cake. So we heartily endorse Cups of tea, specifically Yorkshire Gold, Uncle Matt's favorite blend, a custard cream or a slice of cake. And finally, if there was a question of danger at Dead Man's Pass, what might that question be? 
I mean, in many ways, we do pose a question to our readers in this book, because at the heart of this story is a code, or rather a cipher, that Hal discovers. There is a mysterious cipher inside the story. And one of the things that Hal tries to do throughout the story is work out how to crack this code. So in many ways, we're asking our readers to crack this code. Um, but I, and yes, and they might try and um, write a cipher of their own or a code of their own to, to try and send secret messages by themselves. Yes, and I think also, uh, this is the scariest book we've ever written. Mm, In it fact, is. it's the scariest book I've ever written as well. And, and it, some of it is quite terrifying. Um, and I think I would like to know from a reader which bits they found the spookiest that I think that's something that I would you know I'd be really interested to hear um whether they cracked the code yes and which bits they thought were the spookiest absolutely thank you so much for joining us for this month's world book day book club we hope you've had fun thinking listening and talking about books and please please let us know how much you loved danger at dead man's pass sam mg Thanks for being here. It was a pleasure. Bye. Thank you, Kenny. Thanks for having us, Kenny. It was yeah. lovely to be here. We hope you enjoy reading the book. Bye. Bye.